Okay, well, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are meeting with Peter Goldmark, Commissioner of Public Lands for the state. And I, I'm sorry, can I get your name? It's Sandra you. Kaiser, Sam. Director of Communications. Great, and again, I apologize. The remaining members of the uh, editorial board are out of the building today, so you're stuck with me. I'd like to introduce Lauren Dake. She'll be sitting okay. in the uh, corner. And uh, she might be uh, uh, cornering you for some follow-up questions. Um, and Lauren also mentioned she might have to run out of the uh, state house votes on a bill that she's following. So um, anyway, um, thank you again for joining us. Um, first of all, for it, it, as we mentioned earlier, we are videotaping this for use on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and for our readers' purposes, and also for mine, why don't you explain briefly exactly what the Commissioner of Public Lands does? So, great question. I wanted to uh, briefly sketch out what DNR's mission. Commissioner of Public Lands is a statewide elected office, major responsibility of, of the executive of the Department of Natural Resources, and also chair of the Forest Practices Board. So they're two separate state agencies combined under the Commissioner. DNR's mission is a complex one composed primarily of earning revenue to support education uh, on trust lands that were acquired by the state and given uh, in 1889 by the federal government at state rate. So we have and an- I'm sorry, when you say education, that goes to public education? It goes to public education, yes. Primarily K through 12, but also uh, our two large research universities, WSU and University of Washington, as well as baccalaureate. Uh, university uh, colleges as well as uh, counties and prisons and we have 13 different trusts that we manage for. We have different landscapes that comprise those trusts. So the major component of course of the trust revenue comes from the uh, harvest of timber. So we are the timber agency for the state of Washington and in fiscal year 14 we earned over $260 million for the trust beneficiaries. In addition, when that, when that economic footprint goes into the communities through jobs and the uh, multiplier effect, it, our economists say this is about a $900 million a year boost to Washington State's economy just from the timber value. Now, on the agricultural side, so the timber is about two million acres. On the, on the ag side, it's another million acres. So on the ag side, we've raised um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 million a year. And that has another amplifier attached to it. That's primarily in eastern Washington. And the timber is primarily in western Washington. So it's a large portfolio that we manage. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to sustainably manage those lands for those beneficiaries. Yeah, and I'm sorry, let me interrupt again. Just to put that in perspective, that amount of land, what percentage of the state square miles is that? So, uh, just in terms of acres, mm -hmm. there's roughly 46 million acres in the state of Washington. So, 3 million acres is our primary footprint. However, we also um, manage 2.6 million acres of state-owned aquatic lands for the people of the state of Washington. This is not a fiduciary trust, but it's a, a trust where the revenue goes to support environmental, um, environmental stewardship, it goes to support uh, recreation and access, and also the money that's used from that supports different aquatic enhancement activities. Uh, examples of those activities are um, aquaculture, uh, log booming, and overwater structures are the kinds of activities that occur on state-owned aquatic lands. The entire bedlands of the um, Sound are state-owned aquatic lands. The bedlands of half of the Columbia River are state-owned aquatic lands. The bedlands of every navigable body of water as of statehood in 1889 are state-owned aquatic lands. And then in addition to that, we're the regulator of forest practices, um, meaning timber harvest or road building on all private and forest lands within the state of Washington. And that footprint is bigger than, obviously, than, the, than just our ownership. Yeah, that that uh, footprint is about 9 million acres of warehouser land, 
Rainier land, DNR land, all small forest landowners as well, where we are charged with regulating, meaning um, having the regulatory oversight of how uh, timber practices, timber harvest and road building practices are carried out. So we have a regulatory component. And then in addition to those three responsibilities, we're also the state's largest on-call wildland firefighting unit. And I'm going to come back to this theme, but we do have a major responsibility on roughly 13 million acres of, again, private forested land, state forested land. In, in many cases, we, we help on tribal land, and we interface with all different jurisdictions, with all the fire service jurisdictions around the state in terms of municipal response, in terms of tribal response, or in terms of other jurisdictions response. And as a matter of fact, today and for the next couple of days, uh, the incident management teams that uh, help with complex fires are meeting all here in Vancouver, and they're getting their annual refresher training. Mm -hmm. So there are an additional um, somewhat five or six hundred uh, staff here uh, in Vancouver, staff from both Washington, Oregon, and maybe even a few from Idaho that are getting trained up and prepared for the upcoming fire season. Now, I'm, if, can I continue on fire? Sure. So, of course, last year was the state's worst fire season. We had the Carlton Complex fire, which was just short of a quarter million acres a very expensive destructive fire that occurred on July uh, 14th, I believe it started on the 14th and 15th of July, and under high winds and low humidity and very high temperatures proved very destructive. Fortunately, no lives were lost, no firefighters were killed, uh, but it was a very destructive wildfire. And the total acreage of uh, wildfire, of land consumed by wildfire last year was a record. Mm -hmm. So I have asked the legislature for additional resources because, as it turns out, last year was bad, but the forecast for this year is just as bad. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandy has some maps that she can share with you that delineate uh, the existing uh, lack of any snow water content sure. throughout the West. It's at extremely low levels. And you can see from the map, um, so the snow water levels are there on, on your left and, and mm -hmm. on the right is the National Weather Service forecast for summertime temperatures showing a repeat of heavy heat in the west, notably on the west coast, the, the extreme west coast, and then moving inland. So from the National Weather Service perspective, uh, they're, they're forecasting a repeat of last year in terms of a very bad mm -hmm. fire weather situation. I've asked the legislature for another $4.5 million dollars for additional fire engines, staff, helicat crews, and training um, so that we can deal with fires, a uh, complex of fires that inevitably start when there are, uh, when there's a lot of lightning. Mm -hmm. the, um, now you talked about the financing. It, when it comes to fighting wildfires, how much of the funding is state, how much is federal? When we, when DNR goes to a fire, and by the way, the fire, the fires that we respond to can be on any jurisdiction. The, um, the convention is closest forces always uh, re respond. So if, even if it's on Forest Service land, if we're closest forces, we respond. Uh, and at the end of the fire, for each incident, there is a uh, apportionment that is done uh, regarding time spent on different ownership and who spent what time on what ownership and how the fire cost is split out. So in some cases, it may be entirely on DNR responsibility, that 13 million acres. Often it's split between our responsibility and the Forest Service, and the teams meet, if it's a team fire, which can occur, um, then the teams meet at the end of each day and make the call on how, how much of the resources were on what land ownership. And then at the end, it's, it's summed up, and that's the agreed upon sort of apportionment process. Now, and you say you requested an additional 4.5 million from the legislature. Correct. Um, how would that money be apportioned? Where would it go? Well, it would go, as I said, to um, to help fund for more fire engines, more staff to to staff those fire engines, uh, hell attack crews to uh, arrive at the fire with our helicopters on initial attack, 
and also for advanced training. We know the weather and the fire conditions are changing, and we need to train our staff accordingly. What, what kind of reception is that received in Olympia? So you may know uh, Olympia is in a little bit of a debate right now about um, whether uh, what level of funding. And we know of the McClurry decision, and we know of both chambers uh, making some serious effort to fund that. Uh, the Senate hasn't proposed any new revenue streams. The House has. And so in the House, the proposed budget includes um, about 60% of my request for fire funding. And the Senate proposed nothing. So I'm working, with the, I'm working with the Senate, I'm working with the House to convince them that an investment now can help prevent a huge cost of, of fighting fire in the coming season. So the investment will be very well returned in terms of keeping fire small and cheap as opposed to not having the engines and staff necessary to get the fires out and keep them small. My goal is to keep 95% of the fires 10 acres or less and to keep the firefighting expenses down for the state. Once they get big, they get enormously expensive and I want to avoid that. Last year, Greg, we asked for resources. We didn't get them. In the fall, we had to go back and present a bill for $73 million after the last fire season. Really hoping that's not going to be the case this time around. Yeah, you know, and and one thing, uh, it's my understanding, and, and correct me if this is inaccurate, but my understanding, one of the problems has been that the federal budget for fighting wildfires that they have been drawing money to fight wildfires that have been drawing that from prevention funds, correct, which has created the cycle. They aren't using the prevention funds to prevent or reduce eventual forest fires, which makes them more costly. Is that accurate? How does that work? It is. It is. And the Forest Service has, as we say, been forced to use the same dollars that they would use to fix a picnic table or conduct forest health uh, work as to fight fire. And so they've always been having to hold a lot of money back to fight fire because the fire, the seasons have been very destructive. Now there have been some efforts continuing in Congress to make it, to change fire fighting for the Forest Service over from their maintenance budget to the FEMA budget, to an emergency mm -hmm. response. I think that, that makes perfect sense. As a matter of fact, I wrote an op editorial in the Washington Post that was published uh, last year advocating for Congress doing exactly that. And I believe there's some, uh, there's some effort in Congress as we speak to include that or a portion of that in some other funding uh, legislation. So folks recognize that, um, but as you know, Congress isn't the quickest one to act even on emergency funding. It, it, tell me this, when all indications are that uh, wildfires are getting worse, that they're going to continue to get worse, until they threaten homes or dwellings or structures, why don't we just let them burn? Well, um, actually forests are very valuable. So my responsibility is a fiduciary responsibility to generate revenue. If I stand idly by and I watch the state's forests burn down, then the revenue stream that would be um, a, a potentially uh, gained from that landscape is gone. And oh, by the way, uh, they're very, um, there are a lot of creatures and plants. Uh, some of the, those creatures are endangered that call those woods their home. Um, those trees, as a matter of fact, perform many, many very valuable, as we call them, ecosystem functions. They clean our air. They fix carbon. They provide habitat. They um, reduce the flow of water so that it comes off gradually over time. They, they perform an innumerable number of essential services for this state to be both beautiful, productive, and home to many wild and wonderful things. Not the, and in addition to that, of course, the public loves to recreate and would, I'm sure, much rather be in a standing green forest than a dead landscape of sticks. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so regarding the uh, 
the federal funding you mentioned, one idea is to switch the money to FEMA, to emergency fund. Like other emergency right. uh, events, like other natural disasters. How, how does that compare? How is the funding set up in the state? So in the state, we draw basically from an open checkbook to fight fires above and beyond our budget. Now, currently, we get a core amount of funding, which is about $22 million a year. That's our base funding. Over and above that, we have to come back to the legislature. For firefighting or for the whole department? Just firefighting. Okay. Just $22 million, just for firefighting, just for suppression. Over and above that, we have to come back. If there is a bigger expenditure than that, we have to come back in, in the next session and ask for a supplemental budget. Mm -hmm. And today, thank you for the legislature, they've always funded that. So that's in sharp contrast to the federal way. Sure. What would happen if they didn't fund it? Um, the state going. They yeah. have a I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine them not doing it. Yeah, it seems like they wouldn't have a choice. Um, hopefully not. How effective are our suppression, um, or I'm sorry, prevention? Tenders? So that's. Thank you for asking that question because it, it brings up the whole issue of forest health which is a major issue in the state of Washington because of drought and over dense stands and heat and climate change, which are really stressing the trees, mostly in eastern Washington so far, and creating a lot of dead and dying stands that are opportunistic places for insects to attack as well. So I have been working since um, my election in 2008, working with the legislature to uh, acquire funding through the capital budget to be able to fund the activities, because they're often not producing as much revenue as the expense takes, to go out and do this forest restoration work, this forest health work. We want to go in, cut down the dead and dying trees, cut down the non-native trees that are more susceptible to bugs and drought, open the stands up to a de stand density that can be sustained during the drier uh, regimes that we're experiencing these days, and get that burnable material out. Some of that material is usable uh, in combination with the forest health work. I've been working to get biomass to energy technology to work because I'm convinced that some of that material that we bring out would, could be converted into usable forms of energy and help on the uh, expense side of the equation as well as removing the material so that it's not around uh, to support fire. And that effort has been of some success I asked for $20 million last year, I got last, uh, last biennial budget, I got four. This session I asked for $20 million again, and that number is still in play, so I don't know what the result is. But part of the reason I'm asking for this money is not just to do the forest health work, which is, a, which is essential, but also to do firewise work, to work in communities to help them understand the need to clear the burnable material out from the facility of homes that are situated in and amongst forests, which we see increasingly across the state, where everybody wants their slice of heaven out in the, out in the forest, and they don't necessarily clear around uh, their home, they don't necessarily plaid their roofs and the structure, the exterior structure with non-flammable material, nor do they remove necessarily wood piles or brush against the home. And so if they don't, the home is extremely vulnerable to wildfires as it, as it moves through the forest, we want to have crews go out and help remove the burnable material and counsel them how to improve their home. That's the, called firewise. The, the, um, uh, you, you mentioned the issue of people increasingly moving into forest lands. Um, how quickly is that increasing? Do you see more of that happening? And how much of a problem is that for your department? So we see an enormous increase in that. Okanagan County, where the Carlton Complex fire mm -hmm. uh, burned, which is also my home county, has seen an explosion of recreational uh, dwellings and mixed into the forested environment. And what that does is it, is it makes it extremely difficult for us. We're the, we're the wildland firefighting agency. Our charge is to put out forest fires, not necessarily to put out building fires. Those are structural folks. So we're not even trained or qualified to put out building fires. Nonetheless, inevitably, if homes or structures are threatened, we get involved in trying to pre prevent the fire from approaching it. So it really is a 
uh, a very complex situation for our crews when they're out on the landscape and they have to make a choice between trying to stop the fire or protect homes. Hey, you mentioned uh, uh, that your department oversees timber sales. Correct. Um, how has that changed? What is the status of fed federal regulations regarding that? Um, how do you foresee it changing in the future? So if I can, let me just tell you one of the visits that I was uh, conducted when I was down here. So yesterday I visited a local sauna, Columbia Vista, owned by Bob Lewis here, just a little upstream from town here. Uh, it's a sawmill that's located obviously right on the banks of the Columbia River. He's a very innovative entrepreneur that buys uh, timber essentially from DNR trust lands and uses that to make um, fairly uh, fairly sophisticated building materials, a uh, considerable amount for the Japanese market. So that sawmill is a very, very necessary component of our ability, mainly DNR's ability, to fund schools. Because if we didn't have anybody to buy and harvest our trees, we wouldn't be able to sell them and then return the money to the trust beneficiaries. Now, insofar as regulations go, there are no federal regu regulations that apply to state and private forests. As I mentioned earlier, our regulatory responsibility, which derives from the Forest Practices Board and a law that was passed in the late 90s called Forest and Fish, is all about salmon uh, restoration. So those laws require significant buffers around any stream that's fish bearing, and actually some buffer even on non-fish bearing waters so that the waters of the state, which are any flowing waters that come off forested land, regardless of who the owner is, those waters are need to be kept clean and cool so that salmon can return to what their native habitat once was and the salmon runs, which have been a large part of the legacy of this state, can return. So those are state, not federal regulations. The Endangered Species Act might also affect some of our harvest as well, correct? Well, the Endangered Species Act is frankly what drove the whole issue around protecting the salmon. Right. But we as well, as Sandy has pointed out, have certain ESA requirements around the spotted owl and around the marble murelet, two, uh, two threatened species at the current time. Mm -hmm. So do those limit your ability to harvest? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We have roughly combined the riparian zone areas that I just described for, for fish protection, combined those with the upland areas that we protect currently for the merlet and for the, the um, spotted owl, we conserve roughly 50% of our landscape just for those endangered species issues. 50%. If you take our landscape of roughly uh, 1.6 million acres within the range of the northern spotted owl and you take 50% of it, it's a very big number. It's over half a million acres that we have dedicated to conservation and habitat for those species. Now, and um, let's uh, move on if we could. Um, uh, another subject that you brought up was regarding the mapping of potential landslide zones. Correct. Um, where do we stand on that? How do we prevent another OSO? So that's an excellent question, and we've been working hard on that uh, ever since that terrible tragedy occurred in, in March of last year. So first of all, what I did as an agency administrator was to impose uh, further administrative a process for any timber harvest proposed on or near uh, areas that could slide. And I did that in May of 2014 as an interim process to make sure that extra care was taken around uh, potential landslide areas connected to timber harvest. And then in uh, early this year, the Forest Practices Board passed a, passed a rule basically putting that administrative uh, directive into rule. So currently then, uh, anybody, state, private, forest landowners, to carry out activities that are on potentially unstable lands have to carry out a 
a geologic analysis to ensure that the land won't slide. In addition to that, I'm very concerned about landslides in general, all over the principally western Washington. And so I've asked the legislature for $6.6 .6 million, basically for um, to use LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging uh, technology, to detect the, the very discrete changes in the landscape to help understand where there are either communities, residences, or infrastructure that could be threatened from landslide. And we don't know where those might be now because we don't have the LIDAR and we haven't been able to do the landscape analysis to understand where the risk is. And what, what can the LIDAR tell us that we don't know now? It can tell us the minute form of the land. And then a talented uh, geologist can look, an, an experienced geologist can look at that landform and see because of the, the manner in which it breaks and it contours where there have been or where there could be landslides. And can use that information to help inform the public or help inform local jurisdictions that have land use decision making responsibility. So it's a really important um, advancement that's the, of LIDAR that's been achieved over the last decade, we need to use it to protect the public safety. Now, yesterday I believed, was it yesterday the bill passed? So yesterday, um, I believe the bill that modifies the language authorizing uh, the Department of Geology, which is within my agency, the Division of Geology, which is in, within my agency, it, it tweaked the language a little bit to clearly uh, give them this ability to collect the LIDAR and and make it available for the public. Well, that's been passed and hopefully the governor will sign it soon. What we're missing is the budget to be able to support that activity. So we're going to be working hard with the legislature. Now, like on the fire funding that I discussed earlier, the uh, House proposed um, a roughly 60% of that budget and the Senate proposed nothing. So we still have one chamber that hasn't acknowledged, in their budget at least, the need to, to fund this very important public safety initiative of, of obtaining the LIDAR, LIDAR and then interpreting it for homeowners and jurisdictions. Now, I have other states use LIDAR. How do we know this would tell us what, what we hope? So the, the um, experienced and educated and informed body of geologists all across the nation know and use LIDAR. It's an expensive technology, so it's not it's not used everywhere. But I will remind I'll remind us that the state of Washington is is not totally unique, but it does have a, a high degree of risk from landslide, volcanoes, tsunami, and lahars. Mm -hmm. And we know that. I mean, almost every week there's a landslide someplace that does harm to some people. Just last week, there was a significant landslide in Snohomish County, right on the, right on the uh, shore of the Sound, and it uh, put at risk four homes. I think those are now unoccupied. And you may have noticed from time to time during the winter months, when rain occurs, it shuts down the Seattle to Vancouver rail line on an almost regular basis. So landslides are a fact of life, and we really need to have the technology to know where the highest risk is, and and conform our activities to where they're not at risk from landslide. Is the risk of landslide, is that increasing? Have there been changes over time or just something we always have and always will live with? So I, I think it's a little bit of both, quite frankly, Greg. I think we all know that the uh, projection is for a change in precipitation patterns. Mm -hmm. We do know that uh, and it's been identified by different studies that up at OSO, at the SR5, uh, 530 landslide, that uh, the unusual amount of rain that fell just preceding the event probably had some significant impact on that horrible landslide. So with <clears throat> a, a warming climate and changing precipitation patterns, and the past norm becoming uh, a different norm in the future, I don't think there's going to be a norm in terms of weather events, we should expect, and it's hard to say this and really understand it, but we should expect the unexpected, mm -hmm. which is difficult to do just by definition. So we have to do the investigation to be prudent and to protect the public.
Now, would your, or is your agency involved at all with uh, uh, the oil trains and coal trains going through the state? How does that impact public lands? So, a great question, and it has the potential to cause great harm to public lands, both in terms of our upland portfolio, but also, interestingly enough, our state-owned aquatic lands, which are incredibly productive lands uh, for a broad array of different species, um, home to the orca, home to salmon, home to eelgrass, which supports these species, home to any manner of a number of, of, of biota. And as you may know, the track from Olympia north to Vancouver, where the coal trains that are going through your community now are heading, because they're, they're going to Vancouver, uh, passes right along the, the shore of the Puget Sound. So as, as oil trains become an increasing mix on the, on the rail, then uh, the inevitable accident threatens uh, the health of those lands, whether they be submerged aquatic lands or uplands. And yes, I'm very concerned about that. I wrote an op-ed into the Seattle Times and was joined by 10 uh, Northwest Indian tribes. Uh, and I believe that op-ed was published in December, mm -hmm. December of last year, expressing our deep concern about the safety aspects of increased transport of oil and particularly Bakken crude by rail. And, and we've all seen the videos and we all know that it's a very explosive and volatile material that they're moving and we all know that there's considerable public risk attached to it. Well, I mean, it's been a big issue for us with the proposed oil terminal in the port of Vancouver. Yes. So we, it, oil trains are kind of the have been the topic of the day for quite some time. And I understand Senator Cantwell was in town two months yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, uh, I believe your department um, is involved with cleaning up um, mining, old mining operations, um, according to your website. Um, how would you be involved with cleaning or uh, uh, oil spills? Or would you be involved with the cleanup? Or how does that work? So just to be clear here, my department requires a reclamation plan mm -hmm. for any pit of larger than three acres. So we require, and so that's kind of another regulatory duty that we have. We require any pit owner larger than that size to have a plan as to how they're going to reclaim the landscape and make it safe when their mining operation is complete. We're not responsible for the cleanup of it, okay. but we do require that reclamation plan to make sure that the landscape is not a danger to citizens after it ceases operation. Now, onto the oil train and your the oil train issue and your question about our responsibility. We don't have any responsibility for cleanup. That is under the Department of Ecology, and they have large cleanup teams both for uplands and water cleanup. As I think you know, there have been some, uh, there have been some uh, tanker issues in the Puget Sound mm -hmm. in the past, and there's some stringent requirements now. There, there's a tug based out on the straits just to um, be able to help any disabled large tanker that for some reason it, its engine quits or something like that can help guide it to safety. So the state has invested a lot in terms of providing cleanup teams and what if help uh, if there's a problem on the uh, on the water. These oil trains are a different issue and I think you know as obviously as a result of Sen Senator Quent Kentwell's visit yesterday that there uh, there's a big question and a big void about what can we do if there is a big disaster mm -hmm. with an oil train. And we've all seen the YouTube videos so we know that they really aren't something that you can fight. They are mm -hmm. so intense and so hot that the best thing to do is just get everybody back out of the way and basically let it burn out, which I think is a sad commentary on uh, on our ability to control emergencies. If we are we really are we really um, okay with having that explosive and um, uh, inflammatory material moving through our communities? Are we, is that really a good thing? It's been a big question. The, um, it, now, given that there would be some danger to public lands, especially the waterways, um, 
how comfortable are you with the current safety measures and uh, for oil trains and uh, new measures that have been instituted over the past several months or the past year? Are those adequate to protect public lands? They talk a lot about when the trains are going through cities, but what about more remote areas that are ecologically important? Well, I share, I share others' concerns about the transition to the newer, safer cars that are less susceptible to rupture um, if they're derailed for some reason. But quite frankly, that's, um, that's going halfway. I think, I think it needs exhaustive study at the federal level, because this is a federal issue. It's an interstate commerce issue, and it needs to be investigated in that regard. Uh, I am concerned from a, from a state uh, perspective that we make progress and make that safe, but I think it's up to the federal government to really set sure. the, the interstate uh, standards. Sure. Right. Um, what other issues are facing your department that we haven't touched upon? Well, we've touched upon landslides, we've touched upon fire, uh, I would briefly touch around forest practices. Uh, forest practices, I've talked a little bit about our responsibility. That division has suffered a lot of um, budget cuts over the 09 10 period, and 10 period, and we're asking the legislature for a slight increase of its budget. We, it has a bigger job now. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was given the added responsibility of um, hydraulic uh, permit, uh, um, hydraulic permitting connected to forest practices, which was heretofore done by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, so we have added responsibility. And then in addition to that, we have the added oversight needed on, on uh, forest practices on or adjacent to unstable slopes. That takes extra scrutiny. So we're asking the legislature for some modest increase in funding, because we only have 45 staff now statewide to review 10,000 applications that are on the books with another 6,000 applications coming in annually. So they have an enormous job to check it at the application stage as it's being written, and they need to check it pre-harvest, during harvest, mm -hmm. and then post-harvest to make sure that these rules are followed and that public water is protected per rule. Now you've talked about several uh, different instances where you've requested additional funding from the legislature. Obviously, every department manager wants more funding. How do you go about selling your department to the legislature? What makes you more important than other departments? Well, I would just point out that this is the first time I've asked for enhancements. Mm -hmm. I have been very restraintful and respectful of the legislature's task dealing with a very difficult budget uh, that was um, sort of the crashing state economy when I took office in the mm -hmm. spring of 09 and the late winter of 09. My budget was reduced roughly $30 million in that, in that out period of time. Much. I had to lay off 200 people. I had to do all kinds of cutbacks. I cut back coffee to my board meetings. Mm -hmm. I cut back all subscriptions. I mean, I was just going everywhere to find a way to reduce cost. Now, so I, I've been a really good steward of scarce resources. Mm -hmm. That's my point. But there's a limit to how long I can stand on the sideline and not recognize that the public, the public health and safety is threatened by these, um, by these natural disaster potentials from fire and from landslide. And I must step forward and say, these are important issues that the legislature needs to acknowledge. We've had really, um, really destructive events just this past year. You need to recognize that, partner with the, partner with the department to help make our people safe. Yeah, excuse me, and you say uh, the budget was reduced about $30 million out of how much? What is your total? So budget? our annual budget is over $300 million. But the budget reduction was mostly, um, was actually largely in the general fund and somewhat also in our uh, management funds, which derive from our activities that we carry out, harvesting timber or on the agricultural leases. So that was a devastating amount of general fund to lose, and it caused reductions at the fire, <clears throat> at the fire protection level, in forest practices, and to some degree in geology as well. And all of those functions uh, are a component of public safety in the state. With um, last year being a record year for wildfires, and this year expected to be more of the same, is that the new reality? Should we prepare for that 
year after year after year, or is it kind of random? So um, I'm not one to predict the weather. I think that's a dangerous thing to do. But we do know that for, and for debatable reasons, this area is, the Pacific Northwest is warming. Mm -hmm. And that uh, we just had the warmest March now let, ever. Let's debate it. What are some of those reasons? Well, I mean, some people, so there's a noted um, climatologist up at the university by the name of Cliff Mass. And he, he has uh, his own um, rationale about why we've been experiencing warmer or hotter summers. And it, he says it's not necessarily because of human activity. Mm -hmm. Now, others would say quite the contrary. They, they point to the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse impact of that, the fact that we've gone from 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million now, and, and how that causes the radiation that would otherwise go back mm -hmm. out into space is now reflected back and warms the globe. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't really want to get into the, the debate. I'm a scientist, so I have my own personal opinion. But for me, regardless of what the cause is, I have to deal with the consequences of that warming environment. And the consequences being deteriorating forest health, increased risk of wildfire, increased severity of wildfire, and increase in terms of lightning starts that are predicted because of the increased temperature uh, contrast between um, north and south that, that create the energy behind thunderstorms. So these are the realities I have to deal with. And I have to deal with the possibility or probability of increased precipitation events and how those might increase the risk of landslide. Mm -hmm. I think that's my public responsibility to deal with those. And that's why I'm going to the legislature and asking them for support so I can do my job. Great. Well, Peter, are there any other issues we should touch upon? I think those are the major ones. <laughs> oh, great. Um, Sandra, anything else? Oh, any I think I've covered it. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to follow up with me if there's anything mm -hmm. when you look at your notes or, or also for you that um, if there's anything that you're thinking, oh, I need to know more about that. There, there is quite a bit on that flash drive I gave you. Okay. Take a look at that, but happy to, you know, fill out any details that, that would be useful. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you for the conversation. Oh, sure.